on 17 January 1968 on a cold winter night, 31 figures cautiously approached the border fence. With a deft cut, they slipped through, making their way into the American side of the demilitarized zone, a buffer between North and South Korea. The men were members of the 124th Army Unit, an elite military group tasked with executing guerrilla operations against the southern enemies of the North. Unit 124 was formed by selecting 31 hand-picked officers from the Korean People's Army, North Korea's military, with a specific mission of infiltrating South Korea via the demilitarized zone and eliminating the president, Park Chung-yi, and his designated residence at the Blue House in Seoul. Park practically ruled as a dictator, confronted by substantial opposition on the home front, and starting from 1966, he became actively involved in the Korean DMZ conflict against North Korea. In 1967, the North Korean leadership reached the conclusion that Park's grip on power remained strong despite domestic opposition. This shift was attributed to his authoritative governance approach and his triumph in both the presidential and legislative elections held earlier that year. Nonetheless, the North Korean leadership held the belief that the elimination of Park could trigger political upheaval in South Korea that could potentially pave the way for a communist revolution, fostering conditions akin to the North Vietnamese approach during the Vietnam War potentially leading to a North Korean-led insurgency against the South Korean government. The selected members of Unit 124 underwent intense training for two years, preparing for the mission to eliminate Park. This training encompassed a full-scale replica of the Blue House, where they spent two weeks practicing the operation. As the team crossed into the DMZ, swift and unnoticed, they trekked through the rural expanse of South Korea, heading towards Seoul. It wasn't until the afternoon that they reached Bapuan, a village seven kilometers east of Paju. They came upon four civilians near the village. The civilians promptly alerted the local police, signaling the presence of the unit. Unit 124 knew that security forces in Seoul were aware of their presence. In response, they switched to uniforms from the local military and split into smaller groups of two or three men. They had coveralls on top, and under that, South Korean military uniforms, and they were loaded with weapons. Each soldier had a submachine gun, a pistol, eight grenades, and even an anti-tank mine. After spending two days in South Korea, the raiding party encountered four woodcutters. This encounter posed a significant threat to the mission, given that South Korean citizens frequently reported suspected infiltrators. However, the timing was unlucky as it was January. Eliminating them wouldn't have been the best idea, and the task of digging graves in the frozen ground would have proven both arduous and time-consuming. There was a concern that the woodcutter's absence could draw the attention of their families, potentially leading them to involve the police further. Instead of resorting to force, the soldiers seized the men and quickly improvised a propaganda session. During this impromptu event, they passionately denounced Park and the United States, while making fervent promises of imminent unification under the guidance of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Before departing, they cautioned the woodcutters against divulging any information about their encounter. Despite this admonition, the civilians promptly relayed the details to South Korean police, setting in motion a relentless manhunt to locate the team. While South Korean police scoured the area for a group of North Korean guerrillas, the soldiers of the 124th unit infiltrated Seoul. Shedding their coveralls, they emerged dressed in South Korean military uniforms, embarking on the final phase of their mission. On January 21st, things got dicey when they were stopping at a checkpoint not even 100 meters from the Blue House. The unit's cover was blown when the local police chief, smelling something fishy, pulled out his gun. And well, things took a bad turn. A shot went off, sparking a crazy shootout and kicking off a massive manhunt. In the heat of the fight, two members of the raiding crew lost their lives. The captain of the unit gave the order for the commanders to disengage and disperse. They fled, most heading north. As the following days unfolded, only two more of the remaining team held on. While on the run, they either made the grim choice to use grenades to escape capture, leading to their own demise, or face the unrelenting pursuit of South Korean and American security forces, ultimately meeting their end. One of the survivors successfully returned to North Korea and has since risen to the rank of general within the North Korean army. The other individual, Kim Shin Jo, was apprehended by South Korean forces. Kim's escape took him up Iwang Mountain, pursued closely by South Korean soldiers. Along the way, he discarded all of his weapons, except for a lone grenade reserved for a last resort exit. Kim later recounted that a sudden urge of a will to survive halted his intent to deploy the grenade, especially when he found himself encircled by 20 South Korean soldiers. His last grenade, however, was defective, leading some to doubt his story. While in the custody of South Korean authorities, he underwent interrogation, and his weaponry underwent scrutiny as intelligence services aimed to unravel his involvement in the foil Blue House raid. Displaying cooperation, he provided information, and the authorities documented that his firearms had not been discharged even once. However, this choice to abstain from engaging in combat and to surrender voluntarily came with a heavy cost. As Kim's priority was his own survival and he willingly surrendered to South Korean authorities, he found himself labeled as a defector in the eyes of North Korea. 
This designation resulted in the tragic elimination of his family back at home. Years passed before Kim could uncover the fate of his parents and six siblings. It was only through the account of another North Korean defector that he eventually discovered that they had undergone a public trial. The North Korean infiltration targeting the president was a staggering shock to South Korean society, but it wasn't a complete bolt from the blue, especially for the CIA. They had gotten wind of North Korean plots at least six months prior to the Blue House raid. As time went on, Kim Shin Jo underwent a process of rehabilitation. The South Koreans viewed him as a soldier who was simply following orders. His choice not to discharge his weapon, combined with his cooperation with security officials in detailing North Korean special forces units and training, held significant sway in his favor. He was pardoned and let go on April 10, 1970 with no charges against him. Just half a year later, he married a South Korean woman who had been corresponding with him as a pen pal during his time in custody. Interestingly, before agreeing to meet her, he had the intelligence services look into her background due to concerns about her potentially being a North Korean assassin. She wasn't, but she did manage to influence Kim Shim Jo to embrace her faith. However, another shocking incident was yet to unfold. Just two days following the Blue House raid, North Korea captured the USS Pueblo, a US Navy spy ship engaged in communication monitoring along the eastern Korean peninsula coast. One crew member lost their life in the event, while the remaining 82 were taken to North Korea, where they remained for a year. Eventually, negotiations between the US and North Korea facilitated their release. While it was initially thought that Unit 124 had been dissolved after the raid, its legacy has been carried forward through the establishment of North Korea's special battalions within the reconnaissance agency. These specialized units were created with the purpose of engaging in intelligence collection and espionage activities in South Korea. There was the threat of further guerrilla activity from North Korean commandos. Life for North Korean agents and commandos heading to the South was undoubtedly challenging. Undertaking missions within enemy territory posed significant risks, and by the end of 1967, South Korea had already eliminated 130 infiltrators and apprehended 43 others. North Korea showed little enthusiasm for getting back its operatives once they were apprehended. Diplomats gauged the possibility of North Korea exchanging the Pueblo's crew for detained North Korean agents as unlikely. This was because North Korea placed a higher value on its American captives than its own guerrilla operatives. Furthermore, North Korean propaganda disclaimed any connection to the soldiers and spies dispatched to South Korea. Instead, they chose to portray them as part of a basic rebellion against the Park dictatorship. Initiating negotiations for the repatriation of captured infiltrators would essentially entail an implied acknowledgement of guilt, thereby undermining North Korea's propagated narrative. North Korea believed that taking out the president would create a rift between the US and its South Korean allies, possibly sparking a revolt within the South Korean military. However, the outcome was quite the opposite. It reinforced the US's commitment to the South Korean security and intensified the gap between the population and their supposed liberators. Kim later became a pastor at a big church. He has a wife and two children, and at the age of 81, he still bears the weight of choices he made half a century ago, even as the events of the past have gradually receded into the shadows of obscurity. But let us know what you think in the comments section below. If you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.